Masterclass Series for the, in Agriculture and Environment from the University of Western Australia. We're actually in Perth, Australia. Um, lucky for us, it is sunny here. Uh, my name's Kirsty Brooks, and I'm so excited to host this series. We'll he be hearing from a number of experts in the coming weeks on how they're tackling global, regional, and local issues in our natural environment. And I'm gonna start with a traditional welcome to country that we do in Australia. I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Western Australia uh, is situated in Perth along the Bilya Mali or the Swan River. This area is Noongar land and we recognise that the Noongar people will remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practise their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. Now let me introduce you to our speakers. Welcome Liz Barber and Dr Brian Burroff who will take us talk to us today about how Cooperative Research Centre of Honeybee Products is authenticating honey from the apiary site to the shelf. So Liz Barber, who you can see there, is the CEO of the CRC for Honeybee Products. Within the centre, Liz oversees 30 projects focused in four programs of apiary science, honey chemistry, honeybee health, as well as traceability and marketing. A major deliverable to the industry is the establishment of the honey assurance system that links the Australian flora to the honeybee product on the shelf. And this is what you'll be hearing about today. I'll also introduce Brian now as well, who's an environmental geographer here at the University of Western Australia. Dr. Boroff has expertise in the application of geographic information systems and remote sensing to a range of environmental management issues whereby he has contributed to the advancements in technologies in these areas for the fields of population health, planning, international development and environmental science. All right, so that's all the formalities out the way. I'm gonna pass you over to Liz and we'll hear from Liz first and then Brian, um, and then we'll come back together and we'll have some great question and answer time. Over to you, Liz. Great, thanks Kirsty. Thanks for welcoming us all and welcome to all of you all around the world. Just really thrilled to be able to tell you something about our uh, honeybees here in Western Australia and across Australia. So, as you know, we're actually based in Western Australia, but the Cooperative Research Centre actually covers um, right the way across Australia. Um, today, because this project has sort of been, um, I'd say, sort of tested here in Western Australia, there will be a bit more of a focus what's going on in this state. Um, so this picture, which you will see in front of you, is some of our honeybees. I was actually out with our, uh, with our beekeeper last week, and this is actually this picture that we took. And as you see here in Western Australia, we have mainly the Italian and the golden bee. And as you can see, it's actually um, really, very pretty to see. You can see that um, we use it because it's actually very docile. Um, you can see there they're both drain, drones and their workers. And of course, I hope you can see the new babies just coming out. So it was actually a very exciting day watching that. So we also do have a bit of the Corsican and also the Carniolian um, bee here, but they're mainly the feral bees that come in. So um, you can see them quite distinctly. I guess one, just to give you background, what we do here is um, we've, we sort of did a survey of um, you know, when diseases arrived here. Um, so really, we've only had honeybees in Western Australia since, um, I hope you can see that, is that a bit too small? Um, so it's 1841. Um, basically, what I wanted to point out is that we don't have some major diseases here. We don't have varroa. We've got one of the very lucky places. The whole of Australia doesn't have varroa, so we're actually very lucky for that. And uh, we don't have European fowl brood. And we don't have the hive beetle, certainly down in the southwest, which is the main production area of honey. So a result of this is that we really don't use antibiotics here and we don't use miticides. So our honey production here is pretty is chemical free. And if we keep to the forests, uh, we really don't get exposed either to any pesticides or any insecticides at all. So it's one of those sort of things that we're actually very proud of the honey. We actually have produced a very clean product. So on top of that, we really want to know more about in terms of what have we got. 
Anyway, so just to show you about the forest, so we are very dependent on our forests and uh, we move, the beekeepers here move constantly. We are one of the few places that actually can keep our bees producing right throughout the year. So by moving great distances, um, our beekeepers never ever have to actually feed their bees. So there's no real overwintering. They go up north where the temperatures are warmer, we've got flowering, so they keep moving and keeping their bees going. Um, so on average, um, across Australia, we, uh, whoops, sorry, I hope you go on the next one. I'll just go to the next one. So over and around Australia, we, this is our honey production. It is on the decline. There is a, there's of course, there's a few issues that are coming into play. And uh, these issues are, uh, of course, we've been also you know, hit by climate change as everybody else in the world. We have had a massive increase of beekeepers and especially hobby beekeepers. And um, we've actually increased um, in our numbers. Literally, we were about uh, 500 beekeepers in, um, in 2008. And we're already up to over nearly 4,000 beekeepers at the moment. We're literally, getting about 40 to 50 new beekeepers every month. So beekeeping is extremely popular here in Western Australia. Um, the other thing that's changing is that from honey production, there's a big change going from beekeepers focusing on honey production to moving more onto pollination services. Um, we've just had some enormous um, plantations of avocados come into the area. Um, we've had some other um, almonds, of course, are coming in, and especially on the East Coast, almonds are actually becoming quite a major crop that needs pollination. Um, there's also land use change. Um, we've had uh, forestry, mining, and of course, development are certainly taking away some of our areas. And unfortunately, like has been happening in many places of the world, we're also suffering with fire and, of course, the control of that fire through prescribed burning. So we are having a bit of our resource affected as we go along. So there is a slight reduction in honey, but what it means is that the honey that we produce is actually becoming rarer and it's becoming more valuable. And in that we've actually got, so our native honeys that we've got, we've got some really iconic honeys that actually come from Australia. Most famous, of course, is the Manuka honey. Um, as you know, there's one species of leptospermin produced that produces honey in New Zealand. We are just, um, we're very lucky that we've actually just got so many species here. We've got more than um, 80 species here. And most half of those actually produce the DHA active ingredient. So we're actually getting very excited. The main, there's three regions that really produce that Australian Manuka. And that's sort of um, New South Wales, Queensland. And of course, down in Tasmania, which is where the Scoparium is based mainly. And then of course, we've got a, a very unusual species here in Western Australia, which is out and near Espence region. But of course, the other many other iconic ones, Leatherwood is very well known from Tasmania. And then of course, we in the West Coast have actually been pushing um, the Jarrah honey, which is a very high bioactive honey as well. So to do all this, to show that we have got, you know, so this traceability is actually becoming very important for to us, not only because of food, um, food assurance, but also because we want to trace um, where the product comes from. So we've actually joined forces with BeQual Australia, which is an industry owned quality assurance system. So our, our umbrella body, which is the Australian Honey Bee Industry Council of Western Australia, actually set up the BeQual Australia. And uh, at first, the first thing that they really wanted to do was to make sure that um, that a safe, wholesome quality food was produced. So if you see a beekeeper, it has got their bee qual registration, they're actually audited to show that, um, that it's from a known forage source, that, they, that all the um, paperwork in terms of agricultural and veterinary chemicals is documented and known, the management and hygiene of the hives is, is monitored, and also about their, their processing plants. So they do HACCP, they follow HACCP. So the management and hygiene also includes all the biosecurity. And we've actually been adding a lot more about the biosecurity aspect into the BeQual system. So our role that we've been doing with BeQual Australia uh, is actually to digitize this BeQual. When we first started working with um, the BeQual Australia, 
all of this was actually in paper. And uh, we partnered with them to get this all digitized. And so the reasons for this, of course, is you know, easy proof of product quality and source. So when the beekeeper arrives at the packer, they can literally download whatever information the packer needs about their product. Um, for the beekeeper, it's a continuous improvement system. Um, the most important thing in the industry is that then they can benchmark um, between each other, see how they're going in terms of their systems, productivity, whatever they need to compare. Um, the other thing is that it's building up of industry knowledge. Um, you know, often we ask questions, you know, about our industry at this point of time, we actually can't answer. So this is actually will be the system where we can actually defend um, the or give information about the what our practices are in our industry and how well we're doing things. The best thing about this also is, is that it, it adds, you can add on to other systems. So whether you're doing sensors and hives and uh, or whether you are actually adding on sort of better business models on the other end, either which way it actually would help. So now we've done that. So, so basically the APRI site to pack a traceability system, if a beekeeper belongs to BeeQual Australia and follows their system, they're actually providing that at the moment. Um, what isn't actually happening at the moment is that we haven't actually got that honey assurance. And as most of you know, is that uh, you can't control a bee. You put the beehive wherever it is, the bee does its wonderful waggle dance, and then of course it sets off and it goes to between both the nectar and the pollen. But what we have here in Sydney in, in Western Australia is that there is a a 3k radius um, for an apri site and um, for all the things that we the literature that we've been looking at and everything that we've been trying to find how far our bees actually move um, we see that within a forest it's only about 0.7 of a kilometer and when you get to open woodlands it goes to up to about 1.7 so there's plenty of space around that hive that hive apri site and basically this was set up for biosecurity purposes this was to stop the um, the the the, um, the movement of American fowl brood. Um, as you know, it's actually it, it transmits between bees going between hives. So that radius was actually put in place. But what it does is that it just gives us some sort of idea of the area the bees will actually be moving into. So in the Honey Assurance Program, what we're really focusing on is two things. Is one is whether we have got a pure honey. And the second thing is, and the more difficult one, is whether it's authentically Australian. Um, so to do this, what we, what the definition of honey, so first off is, as we know, it's that sweet natural substance. So this is the codex standard that actually is, um, or codex definition of honey. And this is the basis of everything that we do in terms of how we do the chemistry, how we do the tracing, happens is actually we go back to this. So it's really got to be a nectar or something from a plant um, that actually is taken up by the bee. It's that transfer of those, um, the, the, um, the, the, the enzymes that goes into the honey and it's that, that uh, maturing of the honey, the drying out of the honey from the 80% moisture down to whatever it can be for that ripening that's actually really critical to give all those qualities that we keep saying are so important to honey. So this is very crucial, this whole statement. So in the Honey Assurance Program, what we work on is sort of four areas. The moisture, of course, um, it has to be between 14 and 21. And this is actually um, very important for the antimicrobial um, benefits. Um, then it's also that sugar portion and actually what those sugars are. And as you know, honey is mainly um, glucose and fructose. Um, then there's the other part that has been gaining a lot more attention of late is this non-sugar portion of the honey. And we've been spending a lot of time in this, looking at this non-sugar non portion of the honey in terms of finding you know, the differences between the, differ between the honeys. The other part of it, of course, is the pollen in the honey. And um, the, the Chemistry Centre have actually built up a fantastic database for the West Australian honeys. Um, so it's interesting to see how all of these will come together for our honey assurance. So the first thing that really is this is about, this is what we're really trying to deal with is these adulterants. 
So there's quite a list of them. And the problem is, is that they're all much cheaper to produce an ad. They're all man-made and they all can be easily added into honey. Um, the other thing that happens is they actually can come in with imported honey. And so that's a concern in this whole system. So what we've been doing is just, just to show you that when you deal with these corn syrups, rice syrups, glucose, golden syrups, as treacles, maple syrups, they're actually quite easy to pick up. So this is a very um, uh, quick and easy technique that's been um, uh, uh, produced by, um, so it's by Connie Locker's laboratory and Karul is, Islam is the uh, PhD student. And it's just been, we've actually found it very quick to pick these up. So when you actually adulterate just by adding um, substances, it's actually quite a simple process to pick, that, pick up that adulteration. The problem that we have more so is when um, you go to the next stage and that is when you actually have to feed your bees. So the timing, you know, everybody has to, well, there's a lot of places that do have to feed their bees when they go in before they go into winter but it's this timing of when you actually feed and when the bees actually recover and they actually get their own floral sources and so it's this timing of when you actually take off and harvest the honey um, there's actually two there's also remember they go that the, it's the sugars to the nectar to the forages but also we also have the other feeding that happens with the with the pollen and they do can happen in very many ways but again that can also change the signature into the honey so the pollens for the protein for the breeding so we've got these two things that actually can come in that can actually um, add an adulterating influence on the honey so just to go back to the traceability system so um so if you're doing the difference between us, I guess, in agriculture, so if you're in agriculture, you know, you're basically looking at a farm, which is a set site, you put your orchard in, it's set trees, you might have two clones, but it's a very defined area, um, you know exactly what you're harvesting, it'll be, it'll happen in a very defined season, um, so, you know, it'll be spring, that'll happen, you then do your extraction and you go through to the end. When you're dealing with honey, it actually becomes a lot more sort of complex. So this is, you know, the Australian, we've been working on the sub biogeographical regions. These are um, regions that have been argued endlessly between geologists and botanists uh, to agree upon and these are the areas that, they, that we need to, they've worked the system to actually preserve the, the vegetation for each of these regions. So these are very highly contested and well-defined areas. So we've used those and we've decided these are going to be the fences for the areas that we are actually going to define. It actually looks like an awful lot of them, but if you, you really look in Australia, you see that you know, a lot of them are cut out because of the forest, uh, because of the desert, sorry. And um, we only really deal with the periphery of Australia in terms of beekeeping. But the other thing that we also have is that, you know, whereas in a farm, you're only really harvesting one time a year. We have, you know, not only beekeepers move from site to site, as I showed you previously, but we've also got this issue of the seasons. So you could have on one site, you could have multiple flowerings but different plants at different seasons so it and in, and we actually follow the Noongar six seasons which is perfect for our environment um, and you you could have flowering basically in six seasons so you're dealing with every sub biogeographical region and you're dealing with six seasons so the missions actually started and we are actually now going ahead and uh, we started this honey library so we're actually bringing in all the samples and we're, we're collecting all the metadata and we're building this library to characterize each of these honeys. So this is the project that we're currently in and the background to actually how we store the metadata about each of these samples, I hand over to Brian. Thanks Liz. Um, as as Kirsty identified, um, I am a, I'm a geographer, and so I'm a little biased in how I think about 
uh, the world and and how the world operates. And I and I tend to compartmentalize things in in space and time. Um, and so when Liz was talking about this notion of when we started talking about this notion of traceability and being able to pinpoint where honey samples were coming from. Um, my, my brain automatically goes to, well, where was the sample taken from and when was the sample taken? Um, and that allows us to, to really make sure that we're dealing with, um, as, as Liz had identified, um, an authentically Australian honey. Um, so, so that's where I come into the, the BeeQual system and, and this subproject, if you will. I will step back just a moment and uh, identify that I, um, my role in the CRC is uh, the um, theme leader for the project, all the projects that sit under theme one. Um, and these projects are really focused around um, database integration. And, and that is the notion that all of the data that is collected around the CRC, how can we, and that may be uh, um, biological information, that may be chemistry, that may be um, you know, flora, um, a whole suite of, of data that's collected and, and pollen information around uh, the CRC. How do we bring all of that together? Um, and really, the, the, there are some unique IDs, if you will, from a, a database management perspective that allows us to link data sets. And that's really around species, um, flora species, if you will, um, time and location. Uh, so it's, it's sort of been on my team and I to, to really lay the foundations for data integration across the CRC. Um, and so in, in doing so, there's a number of things that we've been thinking that is about, and that is one is, is setting up this data integration platform. And I'll, I'll explain that because it provides the foundation for being able to, um, to trace honeys to a specific location in it, um, across Australia. Um, and around this notion of, of, of species distribution mapping in terms of our, our flora, um, and the phenology of our flora. And, and what I mean by that is uh, when, are, when is our, our different forage species flowering and where, when are they flowering in different locations across the nation? Um, and also being able to, as Liz had identified, uh, our apiarists are traveling over long, extremely long distances to put their bees on, um, on flowering. Uh, uh, on nectar sources. Um, so generally what will happen is, is the apiarists will go and scout locations and see if those locations are, look like they're going to be uh, a viable nectar source in, in the near future. And then, and then they'll decide if it's economically viable to move their, their hives to that location. Um, so having some sort of a, a approach to predicting when flowering will occur in certain locations um, really helps the apiarist in, in terms of saving time and money. Um, and, and then that helps with, you know, how we sort of, um, from really from a business perspective, how, how an apiarist might migrate their hives around the state to maximize uh, production from different flowering events. So there's a series of projects that sit under, under this theme one of the CRC. Um, and I've given you a, a bit of an overview of, of those projects. Now, in terms of supporting the BeeQual bee process, so really we want to, want to get a, a really good understanding, a really good overview of one, where the apiarists are accessing the, the resource, and that is the melliferous flora. And um, when, where, where that flora is occurring, and then when they're accessing it. And, th and this is um, kind of just a nice overview diagram that comes out of uh, one of my PhD students' work that has just recently been published. Um, that it, 
that really draws attention to how important um, bees and, and the bee industry is in terms of ecosystem services um, internationally. So we wanted to, and there, there really hasn't been a lot of research that has gone into, into bee industry in Australia. And so uh, a lot of what we've done is really starting from the ground floor. But we knew we needed to first identify and understand what species are, are actually out there and what species are our apiarists using. Um, and there have been a number of historic texts that um, have, have started to, to pull this story together. And they started, at, they provided our foundation and our starting point of identifying um, all the flora species that the apiarists are using um, either for a, a pollen source or a nectar source. Um, and then we went through a process of interviewing um, our apiarists to identify, uh, to, to collate the species that they're using on a regular basis. So in, in pulling all of that information together, uh, then we, we have a comprehensive list of the, of the forage species that are being used by our apiary industry. Now, that comes with its own set of problems. And, be, and, and one of the major problems is what we call different forage species. Now this becomes really important when we start to link, when we start to link data, different types of data across the CRC, whether, it, uh, so when we, we start to try to link the chemistry data um, to the species that it's coming from, we need to make sure that we're linking apples with apples, if you will. Um, so we went through an exhaustive process of first identifying what the, what the, the forage species are that the apiarists are using, but also making sure we had their names right. And a lot of times uh, people, people use common names to talk about and discuss uh, different flora. And uh, uh, on, on your screen, you're seeing just three examples of, of uh, the, the coast beard heath, uh, red gum and salmon gum are, are, are three common names that when we started digging a, a bit deeper, we found that, well, really when people use these terms, uh, these, these common names, they could be talking about anywhere between three, four, five different species. So we had to start to pick that apart. The other thing that happens uh, over, over um, an extended period of time is species names change. Um, species are broken into subspecies or are broken into two or, or three or four species. Uh, and so these names change. And again, so it, unless we're, we're keeping track of that and on top of it, we could be comparing apples and oranges. Um, but, and, and we wanted to try to avoid that. Um, and I'll give you an example. Just recently, um, one, of our, uh, one of our CRC researchers who's working on the chemistry side of things had a sample that the apiarist is called black butt. Okay. And um, I picked up on this email thread and responded uh, looking through our species database and said, hey, Kate, your, your apiarist could actually be talking about one of six different types of species. Now that's really important when it comes to picking apart the chemistry of specific flora. I'll give you another example of changes in, in names. And this is an example of, of Wandu. And Wandu is, is one of sort of our classic, um, uh, our classic forage um, sources for, for the apiarists. Um, and in 1904, uh, Wandu, uh, paper bark Wandu using the common name, was first um, given its, its Latin name. Uh, by 1934, it was identified, well, we're actually probably talking about uh, two different species. And by 1991, Wandu had been split into six, well, five species. And then by 2019, there was a six species identified. So this is where keeping on top of these changes um, is really important. And I'm, and I'm going to come back to this uh, in, just more, in, in just a minute, because this, 
this is really important and has some significance in, in being able to understand and track, um, and track these changes. So what we wanted to do was make sure that we had, um, we had a database that allowed us to link common names to their species and to their geography. And, and so we have, have spent an exhaustive, um, an, an exhaustive process of pulling together all the species that are being used within, uh, within Australia really, making sure that we have linked the common names to their species names and making sure that those that that taxa is up to date using um, using national species databases uh, of flora uh, identification. Then we've 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 actually collected some additional information that how we house in our database around sort of honey quality and and nectar and and, and pollen quality, uh, but also we've got a good indication of where these species are occurring as well, and so again that that's really important. Coming back to that notion of traceability is is being able to link um, common names as as people are talking about them as 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 samples come into the system, making sure that we can, we know that what, what species that honey is actually coming from. Um, and then also having an indication of, of where, that, um, where that honey is coming from as well. Uh, and, and as Liz alluded to previously, we, we link that back to um, the biogeographical zones. Uh, so we've, we've taken this a little bit farther and, and using some of the data that's out there, including the Atlas of Living Australia, which is a species um, identification um, database and at the national level, as well as, as um, other, other data sources that allow us to identify uh, where species are located. Uh, we've started to update some of our understanding of the, the species distribution of of some of our more, um, more sought after flora for the apiarists. Um, and then we've taken those as, as I identified um, just a moment ago, we've taken each of those species that the species range and mapped those back to the uh, interim uh, biogeographical regions for Australia. Uh, now coming back to that email that I, um, that I, I, I showed you in, in identifying to Kate that, oh, your, your black butt sample could actually be one of these six species. Well, by understanding where one of these six species are, are identified, by understanding where, or the interim, the, the Ibra regions, as we call them, by understanding what Ibra regions these different potential species are linked with, if Kate then tells me that this sample was taken from a certain location, then I can automatically go to, to our database and say, well, it's probably not these species and narrow it down to one or two as opposed to the six it could possibly ba be based on the common name. The other, the other thing that allows us to sort of narrow down uh, what species we're talking about is phenology and, and and particularly the flowering stage of phenology. Now, this is an example of some of the state of the state, really the state of the art in phenology mapping. Um, and, and when I talk about phenology mapping, I'm talking about uh, being able to map across the years, the, the different stages of a plant. Uh, what we're most interested in really is that sort of budding and that flowering stage. Um, and this is some work that uses some uh, out of the United States um, that's associated with the National Phenological Network, which has access to millions of um, samples of, uh, of flora and has access to pictures of those samples. And so what they've done uh, in North America is developed some, some machine learning algorithms that will look at each of these pictures of, of, a, of a sample and identify what the phenological phase was. Um, and this data is, is available. Um, they've got a nice web-based application uh, and, 
and you can go and, and you know explore this and and look at and and map when the different species in the database are are flowering or identify when they're flowering um, and that's all done through machine learning technology now we don't have access to unfortunately to pictures of all of our species so what that means is is that we've actually got to go sit in the herbarium uh, and pull samples out of the shelves and score them um, and so we have started a process of doing that um, so we, 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 again, going back to that database that we've developed, we know the flora that the apiarists are act, accessing. Uh, we've got a good indication of the range. Um, and now we can go and start to identify well, when and, and make some inferences around when these species are flowering. Um, and so again, we're going back to the herbarium, pulling records, and we started scoring our herbarium records. Um, and you, uh, you can see here in the, in the slide that for the Mertaceae's um, uh, species that we're looking at, we're talking about are around 10,000 records, um, which, it, you know, it's a painstaking process, but it's the best we've got at the moment. Oops. Um, and what that then allows us to do is to, much like was done with the, uh, with the National Phenological Network in North America, we're then able to replicate that process uh, and identify when, um, when flowering may occur. Now, bringing that back to, bringing that back to this notion of, uh, uh, back to Wandu. Um, so uh, we identified that there's six, potentially seven species of Wandu, um, Wandu being the common name, um, around the state and they all have different different ranges uh, species distributions they also have different phenologies as well so by understanding the phenology or that and what i mean by that is they also have different flowering times so by by being able to map those flowering times to the species to the region when we have a question around traceability we've got more information to identify where the sample has come from now, finally, moving towards this notion of, well, okay, giving us another tool in our toolbox, if you will, for um, aiding and understanding the traceability. If we don't know, if, if we've got an indication of, well, when the flowering time may be and where the location is, is uh, that a sample has come from, we can actually go back you through historic um, remotely sensed imagery and and identify if flowering was actually occurring in that location um, at that time a, the sample was taken so it gives us another tool to identify if a sample is actually coming from the location that an apiarist is saying it's coming from uh, and so here's a, just an example of uh, giving you sort of a bird's eye view of what what the satellite or what uh what an uh, the airplane or drone may be seeing these days. Um, and this is a, an area of Mary and in, from, from 2018. And you can see that we've got quite a bit of flowering going on, on, the, on, the, on the, in the tree canopy, but uh, in, around the same date in 2019, a year later, um, we didn't have, uh, we had limited to no flowering occurring. So, um, the satellites give us a, an, an imagery that's available, archival imagery, give us another tool to go back and, and trace that honey back to a specific location, identify, well, was there actually flowering going on in that location uh, at that time? This technology also allows us to predict flowering, as I alluded to at the beginning of, of, of my talk. Um, in, our apiarists are traveling, you know, great distances across the state and to save time and money, if we can predict when a, an event is going to occur, a flowering event is going to occur, we can, we can, um, we can save them a, really a lot of time and effort in getting their bees on a, a nectar source. And um, so some of the work that's going on here, and this is another PhD student, Dan, Dan Dixon, who's involved in the CRC, 
is looking at um, how, how we go about predicting flowering events using satellite imagery. And he's been using a combination of drone-based imagery um, and tying that to satellite imagery, which gives us a, a broader picture of the state now. Um, in terms of the geography of Australia, Western Australia encompasses a third of the nation. Um, and so really, you can't cover a third of the nation with a drone. So we've got to be able to, we've got to be able to relate what's happening in a small area to you know, data sets that allow us to see a bigger picture, a broader picture across the state or across the nation. And so some of the work that he's doing is looking at um, identifying how much of a, a pixel. And when I, when I say a pixel, uh, for those of you that are not um, remote sensors, you know, if you've, if you've taken a picture with your mobile phone and um, you, you zoom in and your picture, your, your picture gets pixelated, you know, you see the little squares, you know, the same's going on with a satellite image or, or an image taken from a drone or, or from uh, an airplane. Um, but the satellite image and, and is going to be what we would say is a coarser image. So that, that pixel covers a larger area of the surface of the earth. And so the image that you see on your screen, those, those white squares are, are giving us an indication of say a satellite image uh, in relation to some imagery taken from a drone. So we can use that drone based imagery to identify well how much of a satellite image a satellite pixel is flowering and so we, we can quantify that as the, the percentage of this satellite based pixel that is 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 Mary and how much of that is flowering and that gives us that that allows us to start to predict and make inferences as to where flowering events are occurring. And then we can inform apiarists and they can start to think about migrating their hives. Um, and so the, 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 where, we, where this is heading is, is some sort of a predictive system that uh, would, would provide an output that maybe would look like this, where uh, you would know where your apiary, apiary site was and you could say log on and see that yeah we've got we've got a flowering event starting to occur and we're seeing um, we're seeing percent flowering in the canopy at 10 20 30 um, percent and this is really uh, looking at some of the more specifics of how that's done and it's it's really a relationship between um, how we metrics that we were derived from the imagery and, and what's actually happening on the ground. But again, it, it, where, what I'm getting at is that, again, this provides us another tool within our tool set to really make sure and authenticate the location and the flora that, um, that our honey is coming from. So just, just in a, in a to wrap up kind of what I've been talking about is, is really, an, and again, I'm biased as a geographer, but um, we have a suite and we've been developing a suite of geographic tools that allow us to help in the traceability process. And that's around the time and the date that a sample was taken. Um, you know, what, what the common name of that sample is and, and linking that to the, the scientific name, the, the species name understanding where the, the sample was taken from and, and being able to tie that to a species range um, or to um, a biogeographical zone. Understanding when and the, the coming back to that notion of, of time and date um, and, and the phenology of the species. Was it flowering? Is this, a, is this species known to flower at that time? Um, and then being able to come back using some of those predictive tools, but really in, in a, in a hind casting perspective to, to be able to go back and, and look at some of the archival imagery and say, yes, we know that this, this sample was taken from this location and it was flowering at this time. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, and maybe we'll move towards
I'll, actually, I'll hand back to Kirsty as moderator of this session to, um, to take us forward. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. That was so informative, guys. Thank you both so much. As someone who knows very little about the honeybee world, as much as I've had those conversations with both yourself and Liz, um, it's really great to actually get that insider knowledge and sit down and have a bit more of an intensive session about it all. Uh, everybody's asking some great questions. I am aware of the time, so we're probably not going to get through all of them. Um, I'll just pick out a couple that I think are more applicable because we, I'm, I'm just coming back to that international audience that we do have here. One thing that caught my eye when we are talking about um, tracing the honey, is there a way to look at the origin of the plant in the honey through something like PCR or doing some kind of analysis like that on the honey? You're, you're on mute, Liz. Yes, we've been here. Um, there, there's a lot of investigation into this aspect. Um, it's not as simple as it seems, because <laughs> you've actually got to get a signature for every bit of flora. Um, so that, yeah, so there is a lot of research actually going into that area. Um, it sort of first started off by looking at the pollen, and then we've actually been doing different techniques to try and speed that up. But then it's also gone into you know, a few other technologies, but uh, there's certainly lots happening in that re area. Amazing. And just to confirm, when we we're looking at the adulterants um, in those samples, was that done by thin... Um, yeah, so it was done by yeah. The, yeah, high performance thin layer chromatography. So um, that paper that I actually put at the bottom of that slide has just um, got accepted and, and gone in there. So there's two papers in that area about, uh, and actually there's even, there's another one that actually came from Europe as well. So there is, you'd be amazed how suddenly the HPTLC work has absolutely boomed. And I think the thing that's actually attracted us to it is that it's one machine um, and you can do both the, the sugar, the sugars portion and the non-sugar portion. Um, and then you can do, you know, the, the correlation between the two because you know most of these new um, analytical techniques are trying to use both the sugar information and the non-sugar uh, information to look at the proportions between the two and so that's actually what makes that so exciting. Great. Um, there is another question here about the databases that we're using for the herbarium species and satellite imagery. I guess this is also leading to a, a, a bigger question around ye old climate change potentially, but are we seeing changes in flowering patterns over years? Is there any, any work in that space being done as well that complements what you guys are looking at or what's happening there? Yeah, look, that's, it's, it's a good question and it's one that we've, um, that we've thought about. Um, what we, what we can do with the database based on the samples that we have is we can identify variability by latitude, and which is, which is quite obvious. Um, and and it, it appears within the record as well that, um, that species further north with, with uh, the same species in its northern extent will start flowering before the same species in its southern extent. And that's quite obvious. Um, and that's, that's how things happen. But um, in terms of being able to identify changes across years and associate those as a, as a causal relationship to climate change, I, we just don't have the number of samples to do that. I, I really wish we did, um, but I would be, I'd be very cautious and saying and, be, and pointing to specific changes based on the data that we have. I would love to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're just, we just don't have the data record to do it. I mean, anecdotally it's out there, um, but yeah, being able to provide causal inference. Mm. Yeah, as, as scientists, we need the data to back up what we wanna say. Yeah, and I guess, are you referring to the, um, from my own work, satellite imagery as well, and comes back to that pixel size, being able to narrow down to that size from past data sets from prior to the 80s, 
prior to the 60s, damn near impossible for WA um, or for Australia in general, because we weren't generally a focus around that time in this part of the world. So I imagine that that's also a limiting factor to be able to extend back that far across that kind of decadal period. Yeah, look, I, I think the satellite, using satellite imagery is probably, there, there's a lot of um, possibilities there, particularly with Landsat going back to the 80s. Um, but the, the work that I've presented to you has focused on one species and is still in its infancy. So being able to, to sort of hindcast flowering episodes um, across a broader range of, of flora, um, I, we're just, we're not there yet. But, I, but probably, I mean, those are two viable data. So if we had the herbarium records to do it and we could link that with the satellite imagery, um, then we could probably start to unpick that a little bit more. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a big area of research moving forward, I think. Yeah, future projects on the wish list. That's right. Um, Anybody's interested in doing a PhD? <laughs> <laughs> Let us know. Um, all right, great. Let's finish up with a couple of questions specific to beekeeping, um, I guess at that more local scale. Does beekeeping require specific temperature ranges? And um, is there a way to maybe attract more people into the world of beekeeping? So it does require a specific temperature range. And I guess it's to, do, it's to do with the species of the bee. As you go more north, you go into the Asian bee, which is actually quite different. So bee species change. So here we've only got, you know, the Apis mellifera. Um, and, we, and we're very concerned about the Asian bee actually arriving here because then it'll bring, it's a carrier of four varroa. So there's, so there's certain things. So our bees are more comfortable down in the southern parts of Australia, and mainly because of the humidity, I'd say more than, um, more than anything. Um, as you get greater humidity, we seem to get more diseases. So that's why we get, you know, the hive beetles more in the hu humid areas. And um, so there's different things that actually affect. It's not necessarily, uh, it's also about the flora as well. So it's also got to do with that. And is there a way, are we, are we in a need to attract more people into the, I, I guess this is a double-edged sword because we have such an international audience. I can't speak for other countries, but in Australia, I know that we have, Obviously, people are always wanting to get involved and things like that. Is there any kind of a, a scheme happening in Australia around that? Yeah, so we said, so you know, I was actually got here since 2008 here in Western Australia, we've had a 600% increase in beekeepers. We, um, we honestly, beekeeping is very popular. Our, our biggest challenge we have here now is moving hobby beekeepers into more commercial um, uh, beekeeping. Um, we used to have, you know, quite a, an, an, an old, well, relatively old um, beekeeping um, or beekeepers instead of beekeepers, but I must say the average age is really coming down of late. We've had huge interest in beekeeping here and lots of new ideas coming in. It's really invigorating to see. I think every state has just um, got this massive interest. It seems to be when you look at the the sort of the bee management, you know, beekeeping managed hives. Um, there's a, it seems to be um, a huge boom in the Southern Hemisphere. So the most managed hives are actually in India and then second China. And so here, certainly in the sort of our sort of region, we've just had an absolute boom of beekeeping going on. Um, I know it's a lot more challenging on, in the North, Northern Hemisphere. That's great. All right, I'm going to finish up with a couple more questions before we let all of our beautiful guests go. Um, are we after any kind of donations of pollen, honey or plants? And also we um, mainly covered the biological aspect here. What work's being done in the economic um, realm in, this, in, the, in your research centre? Oh, yes, there is. There's, uh, so uh, Ben White, uh, is actually leading, well, there's two, Ben White's doing it within the CRC, and there's another economist outside the CRC who was actually, we work with a lot, is John Karazinski. 
So Ben White in the CRC is actually um, looking at the value of honey and the value of apiary sites and just really trying to help um, give evaluation to the industry. At the present time, we have very little voice. And so we're actually trying to uh, gain a voice in terms of finding out you know, where we actually sit in terms of valuation. John Karaczynski actually worked a lot on the pollination side and he actually worked out that the pollination services that honeybees provide to Australia is worth 14.2 billion. So, you know, everyone keeps saying, oh, you're, you're a small little cottage industry. And I keep saying, no, we're actually a billion dollar industry. <laughs> so it kind of changes this perspective. In terms of honey production, it's actually, but it's more difficult to actually get a pinpoint because we have so many hobbyist beekeepers. Um, you know, of those big numbers that we have, um, you normally only get about 20% of the beekeeper number actually being commercial beekeepers. So it's very difficult to know, you know, how much people are, are giving to their neighbor and, you know, what's happening out there. So we don't really know the true amount of honey being produced in Australia. And are you after any donations team? Do you need any more information around pollen or plants or anything like that to help with any projects? Oh, absolutely. As much as we can. We, we, did ha we do have a web app that's on, our, on the CRC website. And it's okay. actually about taking pictures and then it gives us a time and place of where that, um, we wanted you to actually take the picture with a bee on it. And that information goes back through to Brian and actually helps him. So we have tried to do it through that way. But I must say that, um, you know, even when I was uh, talking with the Landcare group yesterday, they're doing some amazing stuff, you know, that we're just not connected into. So we, you know, we need to actually link with everybody because the more eyes out there, the more we will actually, you know, get to be able to, you know, get trends and understand things. Um, I guess the other thing that I wanted to say before we go, because I know you're going to close us, is we actually have got a conference next year. So it's at the end of June and it's called the Australasian Honey Bee Research Conference. What's well, a conference, 2021 conference. And um, it's, we're, doing, we're, we're hosting it together with the Bee Industry Council of Western Australia. And Arbic is also involved, which is the Australian Honey Bee Industry Council of Western Australia. So we're all together. And so what it does is a lovely mix of the research together with the beekeepers. Um, so we've, we're opening our website's going to be actually it's there sitting there, but it's actually going to be launched next week. So we'll be tweeting and LinkedIn and whatever you want and <laughs> so to get that all out to you. So um, I know we'll be catering both for online and in person because we honestly don't know where we're going to sit by this time next year. So uh, we're catering for all of us wherever you are, however you want to be. So. Welcome Fantastic. You. Thank you for attending today and a special thanks to Liz and Brian for taking the time out and giving us all a little bit more insight into what's happening in the Australian world of honeybee products. Stay safe, stay healthy and we'll see you soon. Bye.